of mathematics, science, and statistics to ensure that the future of internet is free of bullshit. Uh, it is necessary to recover uh, strategies such as the art of skepticism and critical thinking. For this purpose, Cal uh, will talk in this session with uh, Pablo Ragon, who is a research uh, scientist on knowledge integrity at the Wikimedia Foundation, and Luc Luce Prignano, a researcher at the Universidad de Barcelona and expert in data science against disinformation with the Data Politic project. Um, thank you all uh, for being here. So, uh, we are going to start with some questions uh, to Carl Berston. Uh, internet and social media have changed the way uh, we communicate in, in many ways. Uh, let's start with one, one difference. Before the internet age, with legacy media, uh, information was both uh, a business, a business, and a public service. Now, uh, when we want to, when we want to get informed, uh, we rely on platforms that are uh, selling us ads and, and our data. So, how has this uh, changed the kind, uh, the kind of information we receive and the form we receive it? How can we assure? accurate information and information as a public service and uh, human right in the digital business age? It's a great question, thank you. Um, I think one of the biggest, and, and does my microphone work okay? Everybody can hear okay? Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I think one of the biggest, there's this enormous change. When often when we think about the way that there's a lot more misinformation out there, it's very natural to blame social media. and. That's partly right, because social media is an enormous change, and we can talk about how that's different from traditional media. But there's another, I think, almost equally important change, which is the advent of click-based advertising. Uh, so we've gone from advertising that's essentially uh, based on subscriptions. So the advertising revenue that you get is dependent on how many subscriptions you sell to advertising that's based on clicks. And the reason it matters is when you sell subscriptions, you're trying to sell a long-term relationship with a person. When you subscribe to a newspaper, you're subscribing to the newspaper that you think is going to give you the best content in the long term. When you do something that is click-based, uh, now you're uh, not setting up a long-term relationship, but now all the individual articles compete with each other head-to-head. -head. So I pull up my phone, and there's a story about the war uh, in Ukraine, and I'm thinking about reading that, but then uh, a, 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 a television star was seen with a new boyfriend, and I started to think, oh, oh, wow, and then, and then below that, you know, seven cats who look like Disney princesses, and I think, which Disney princesses, and I click on the cats, and uh, now I've, instead of getting something useful, I've gotten not misinformation, but just plain bullshit. It's just useless nonsense that stole my attention away. It doesn't tell me truth, it doesn't tell me distruth, it just stole my attention away from things that matter. Click-based advertising drives us in that direction. It drives us in a lot of other directions as well. It, in the New York Times, a headline, you know, the stories could try to tell you about the world. These days, the unvarnished truth isn't good enough uh, to just tell us what's true. It's not enough to get us to click. If someone writes something more extreme, uh, then that's more exciting, and we, we click on that instead. And so people are more interested in, uh, you know, in, in extreme headlines, in, in fanciful stories, in, in wild stories. And then the, the and so that's on traditional media, on the social media side, algorithms learn what things we like to click. And we learn too, because we're trying to get people to pay attention to us, and we find that if we write angry or more extreme posts, we get more responses. The algorithms are learning the same thing. So Facebook's algorithm, Twitter's algorithm, uh, whatever algorithm is choosing what content you see is also learning that divisive information is the information that generates clicks. And so the entire structure of our communication system, which is so radically different from what we had 15 years ago, is now designed to keep people engaged for the purpose of selling ads. And there's absolutely no reason to believe that that should lead to uh, more accurate information, information that helps people make sustainable choices, um, information that promotes uh, an informed democracy or anything like that. So I think that's, that's this fundamental change we're dealing with. I think it's very hard to underestimate the role of the economic model of click-based advertising that is driving all of this. 
Um, and I think we need to start thinking about what are alternatives uh, to providing information sources on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, and more uh, difference, more things have changed. In other times, we, collect, we connected with a, a limited number of people, we talked with a limited number of people. Nowadays, we can interact very quickly and very easily with millions of people. And in other times, we had little information, now we have uh, sometimes perhaps too much, yes, too much information. So are we prepared for this amount of information and for all these connections with uh, millions of people? How can we organize and deal with all this so it isn't destabilizing? Yeah, I mean, this, is not, this is fascinating, and I think we, these are big, big. These are the big central questions that um, you know. And Pablo suggested some of these to me. They're, they're, um, you know, these are big central questions in trying to understand how to adapt a society that functions well in the information age. The thing is, as human beings, we're you know what I call uh, information foragers. We have evolved to go seek information about the world so that we can use that information to understand the patterns that are happening in the world and to make good decisions. And those patterns may be, oh, every time the clouds look like this, there's going to be a big storm tomorrow, so I need to do something for that. The pattern may be, every time uh, this person is, is walking that way, they come and pick on me. Uh, whatever. Every time I try to do this with a social interaction, this ends up happening. We forage for information constantly. We're trying to figure out what's happening in our physical environments and even more importantly in our social environments. And so we're hardwired to be seeking information. And in the past, that's always been a very sensible thing to do because there was never enough of it. Now we've created a world where all of our desires are met and more so. We always wanted sugar because there was enough, never enough calories. Now we live in a world where sugar is everywhere and we have an obesity epidemic. Same thing with information. We have this desire for information. We've created a world where now we can be uh, just just drenched in a torrent of information. And now that we've got it, it is doing the same thing to us that too much sugar and fats do. It's, it's hurting us. So we have to change the way that we approach information. And I don't know the answer here. It's going to involve changing the way we think and the way we educate. But it also has to involve changing the technologies that we use. Because now the, the problem is not getting enough information, it's sorting among the information that we get. Because we're getting way too much, we can't possibly process that much. How do we choose which information to pay attention to? And social media was in part supposed to be an answer to that. Things were happening too fast on the internet, there was too much information. No one could possibly curate it all. And, and so there were sort of two ideas, right? We can go back to when we had Yahoo as the sort of the first search engine and it was hand curated and then, then, you, then Google comes along and says, oh, let's do algorithmic curation. So you get algorithms coming in. Social media comes along. Social media says, let's all curate for each other. Let's choose what everyone else sees. Problem is, is we don't have the training individually as, as you know, professional editors or something like that, nor do we they have the incentives to provide the truth. We instead have incentives to, for example, signal performatively who we are, what we're membership. I'm, you know, I'm a, I love Donald, I don't, but I love, you know, I might want to signal I love Donald Trump, and so I'm going to send out these stupid stories that I don't even believe uh, because it signals my membership in a group. And so this curating information for each other doesn't work as well as we hope because our primary aim isn't necessarily to inform one another about whatever we're talking about, but rather to just signal membership. So there are all these changes sort of um, uh, were occurring, and at the same time, the scope and scale, as you alluded to, of, uh, of communication change. So you know, a, few, a few hundred years ago, at most, you could communicate with 100 people in a day, uh, live in a city environment, and you can write things, and, and maybe you can communicate with 1,000. These days, I wake up in the morning, I've got more Twitter followers than are good for me or anybody else, type something stupid, and by afternoon, three million people have read it. There's never been a time in history where something like this can happen, especially not to a very, very large number of people. And there are a very large number of people who have that happening. What happens when information moves essentially unvetted at that speed to that many people? We don't know. We've never done this experiment before. And that's what you allude to, is like, how do we respond to this? Again, we need, I think, to have research about what, uh, about how does all of this happen. We need to have platforms 
that are at least trying to do the right thing, as opposed to being motivated orthogonally by you know clicks. And so uh, again, I don't have answers to these questions, but then I can all I've done really is to elaborate on the questions and why they're fundamentally important. Uh, at the University of Washington, we founded uh, three, uh, almost three years ago now a center called uh, Center for an Informed Public, and we bring together researchers from uh, every area of the university, you know, law and psychology and computer science and communications and biology and anthropology and sociology, and we're trying to understand what all of these profound changes in the way humans operate together and the way information moves through human society, what is that doing to us? What problems is it creating? What are the possible solutions? And we find ourselves in this, in this position that I describe as a crisis discipline where we can't wait and do all this research. If we wait 30 years to try to do anything, by that point we will have had so much misinformation, we will have lost our functioning democracies, we will have failed to deal with pandemics, we will have failed to deal with climate change, we will have failed to deal with extinction. Uh, we have to act now and yet we don't have any theory because we don't understand the world that we've created in the last 15 years. And that puts us in this profoundly challenging, frightening um, position, but we have to rise to it and, and act and yeah. That's, I could, I, of course, could speak about this for hours, so I'll try not to, because I want to hear what my other panelists have to say. As a biologist, you use the metaphor of a flock of birds. Yes, absolutely. And how they respond collectively to some threat. Um, how can we apply this to human behavior and the digital world, the digital sphere? So, some of my thinking about all of this is motivated. That's exactly right. I'm a biologist. I started out studying, actually, uh, how animals communicate and why they don't, what keeps them from lying to each other. And then I started thinking about how information, uh, how, then I started thinking about how disease spreads on networks and then from there it was a very short leap to thinking about how information spreads on networks. And so I started thinking about, well, how does misinformation spread on networks and, and, and that's where, why a biologist is working on all of these things. Animals and the way that flocks make decisions are a wonderful metaphor because flocks we make decisions about where to go. Uh, even though there's no, they don't vote, there's no one tallying the votes, there's no one you know, commander of the birds that says, okay, everybody follow me, but the flock ends up deciding where to go. Bees uh, somehow have thousands of bees choosing, uh, collecting information, and they somehow decide on where to build their next hive. Fish in a school figure out how to avoid predators. We, we know more and more about this, and it's a very active study, uh, area of study in biology, a very exciting one. And we understand more and more about how information moves through these groups. In fish, for example, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, you have a school of fish, and you can say, this school is afraid, this school isn't afraid, uh, in the sense that this school is, is very like the slightest little thing will startle, the slightest little you know, splash will startle the school, and they'll all do a flash explosion that they do to get away from predators. This school over here isn't afraid of the splash, they just ignore it. Well, where does the fear lie? Is it in the individual fish? Turns out that it's not in the mental state of the individual fish at all. The fear of this uh, school that is not in this school literally lies in the relative positions and velocities of the fish uh, related to one another. Um, and so the, there's no, the fear that is in the collective, the behavior of the collective, the decision of the collective, doesn't lie in the individual parts, but rather in the relations among them. And that's sort of a you know, sort of key concept of thinking about all of this, is that the, uh, I have a colleague who I just flew out um, the day before I came to Seattle, came out and he was saying that the, the interaction is the new atom, is when we try to study complex systems, this is, this is Brandon Ogbunu, and he says, you know, the atom used to be, you know, the, 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 our, our kind of fundamental substance, when we, so we, you know, the organism was our fundamental substance. Right? Now we, the interaction is the fundamental thing that we're trying to study. And that seems to be very, very true when we think about how information moves through networks. It's how the, it's not just who the people are and what the connections are, but it's the rules by which the connections rewire and the way that the rewiring changes, the way that the information that's traveling determines which new connections get made, and, 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 and all of that dynamic uh, change uh, results in how the network 
ends up behaving. Now, the key thing from animals, and one of the you know, frightening lessons from animals is that the, the collective decisions that are made by animals, um, they are very dependent on the size of the animal groups. If you take an animal group, of, a school of fish that makes good collective decisions and you double its size, its ability to make good decisions falls apart. Uh, same thing happens with bird flocks, same thing happens with, with, ants, with ants, with bees. Um, so they evolve to be able to make collective decisions on certain scales. What we've of course done with humans is not double the size, but increase the size of the collective from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 to all of a sudden 5 billion people linked together on the internet in an idea, a bad idea that somebody comes up with in their basement to try to drive clicks um, can 24 hours later have reached all of the corners of that 5 billion people linked up together. And the ability of humans to make collective decisions, which maybe we evolved in smaller groups and which we've honed in the rules of setting up representative democracies and all of that, can be threatened by new scales, uh, by aggregating up the way that individuals communicate and, make, and, and sharing the information that they need to make these decisions. So again, this is us landing in a place uh, we're in unknown territory, and we don't know. We've made these changes to our world, and we don't know what it's doing to us. And the final thing, before we bring in my, my co-panelists, is that the platforms are making it even harder to figure out what's happening, because the platforms have all the data about what we're doing, and they don't share it. So as, as researchers, from the outside, we cannot get information on what people are seeing, how they're sharing it, who's spreading it. It's very limited and they, and they keep closing it down further and further. So they, it's as if we're trying to fight climate change, but ExxonMobil is the only person that has a thermometer. And they say, oh, trust us, the thermometer is the same as it was last summer. You just think it's hotter. That's, that, that, that is the, uh, I can use the term, I wrote the book, that is the bullshit that we keep getting from Facebook. The other thing is we don't know what they're doing. What information we see is dependent on the algorithms. The way information flows through the networks is dependent on the algorithms, which are proprietary, which are ever-changing, and which even the platforms, frankly, don't have a very good handle on what's happening. So with the current structure of platforms, it makes this already incredibly hard challenge something that is almost overwhelmingly difficult. And ultimately, and, and we need, and, and this has ultimately has to be very quickly, we need to re-envision what platforms look like in ways that we can study them and in ways that they can further human flourishing and individual access to information and, and rights and dignity instead of just selling ads by making people click. Um, so that's, I told you more than I should have, but that's kind of my answer. So at this point we are going, we are introducing the co-panelists, Pablo and, and Luce. So uh, we are going to talk right now about platforms and, and the way they are not sharing this data or their regulation. But uh, first, I'd like to ask both of you how these uh, uh, things that uh, Professor Burston has uh, talked about apply on your files of uh, research and interest on uh, Wikimedia Foundation and uh, politics. So. First, okay. <laughs> So first of all, uh, I come from the from the field of complex systems. This is um, my background in is I'm a physicist and knowledge, <laughs> and and so I think that uh, our perspective of this is a systemic uh, approach in the sense that we see uh, information, informational system as a sort of uh, ecosystem. And so the, the metaphor of the frogs, uh, you know, we are very fond on. Well, <laughs> well it's your metaphor. We borrow it in biology. So. Yeah, this is really the. Uh, even it is it is not related directly to the, the, the field of uh, communication study or information study. Uh, this is something that is a very foundative uh, metaphor in the, for the field of complex system. Yeah. And so, uh, okay, information and communication are complex phenomena, and uh, we approach the study of this of this kind of. Uh, of topics uh, from this perspective, in the sense that we look at the system as a whole and the, the rules that are governing it, we are uh, looking for uh, 
more or less general rules that can uh, help us understanding the, the phenomenology in a very broad sense. So uh, this uh, focus on, on misinformation, uh, sometimes I have to say that it's a little bit uh, even uncomfortable because it is really, really not uh, focused on something that has converted all the field in some sort of uh, um, maybe um, policy making or a sort of a recommendation, research for recommendation for the, the um, public uh, or the public authority or some sort of uh, um, government or whatever, instead of focusing in, the, in a broader, broader sense on the understanding of what it's happening to us as societies are in the, in the positive and negative aspect. Hmm? This is a little bit important, our, our main perspective um, about this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, everything that you have said is uh, so inspiring. I'm particularly very inspired by all this work on how to adapt the uh, nature inspired models to try to understand collective uh, phenomena. Uh, I'm a computer, uh, computational social scientist. I mean, that I'm a computer scientist who try to play computation to understand social behavior. But uh, all these models, I think we, we have here a biologist, a physicist. So I, I'm not going to occupy, occupy your space as computer, uh, computational social scientist. <laughs> this Usually is what you. we do all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm more engaged in the, the part that you mentioned about clicks. So in, in your case, I work on uh, the Wikimedia Foundation, so one of the uh, differential aspects of uh, Wikimedia in comparison to Big Tech is economic model. Uh, so it's, it's uh, funded uh, mostly by donors, by private donors, and mostly by minor donors. And this is quite different to the models that uh, Carl was mentioning that are mostly based in selling ads. So I totally believe that the reliability of the internet was dramatically damaged the moment that we start to monetize internet activity by clicks. So it means that any feature that we are applying to platforms under that model means that we need to optimize uh, that click behavior. Uh, I think it was to stand up to both in surveillance capitalism when she said like misinformation has become a feature of those platforms because it's fulfilling economic imperatives. Exactly. So it makes sense, like misinformation makes sense to exist because it's supporting those models. So there is, uh, I think it was published in Medium, it was an interview with one of the uh, scientists or main developers on Meta working in recommender systems and how they try to fight uh, misinformation uh, from the uh, perspective of recommender systems. But I think Recommender systems are important and needed when we were mentioning this problem of information overload. One possible way to mitigate information overload is to deploy a recommender system. The problem is like that recommender system in the end need to fulfill that imperative. So it need to fulfill more clicks. So even that they were the and he was recognizing that even that they were trying <laughs> to deploy features of based on fairness and principles to try to mitigate this information, in the end they didn't work because they need to fulfill uh, that capitalist approach, and this is quite different on the aspect of Wikimedia because since we don't need to fulfill that imperative, we can focus on other aspects like knowledge integrity. This base a principle that is based on policies that are designed and uh, evolving over time by their own community. So there is no need uh, to sell more ads or to create more clicks, and I think this isn't the root of the problem that we are discussing today. Uh, let's talk about uh, platforms and regulation. We had a very good discussion about uh, uh, regulation in the panel before. Uh, let's apply this to disinformation. Uh, uh, Professor Calverson points out some actions that can be taken uh, about misinformation and disinformation, careful regulation, increased transparency of digital system, and giving people more control over their online information environment. Uh, in Europe, for example, we have uh, the Strengthened Code of Practice of Disinformation that will be effective in 2023. It is based on platform self-regulations. Uh, do you think uh, is, that is uh, enough? Well, I think asking Facebook to, uh, you know, self-regulation I'm very, very skeptical about, right? So I mean, asking, 
asking Facebook, we were talking, you know, you were mentioning, uh, you know, Facebook fighting misinformation or something like that. Asking Facebook to fight information is uh, like, uh, you know, asking ExxonMobil to fight for more efficient cars. Like, I mean, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but it's just going to lose them money. Yep. And uh, so, so, I mean, they even have, you know, in the U.S., they have got a fiduciary duty to make as much money as they can and, and, and not be too good at fighting this information. The only reason that they fight it is because they are concerned about being shamed or, or legislated against if things get, get too bad. So my, what I want to see, there are many things I want to see, but if I could just name one thing that I think could go a long way, and you may be closer to it here in Europe than, than we are in the US, I want to see individual users have much more control over the information that they receive. And a very simple way you can do this, this is something that in the United States would be, uh, would fall very much under the purview of our Federal Trade Commission. We've got a long history of not only breaking up monopolies, but interfering with companies when there's an information asymmetry that favors a large company over a consumer. And so we see this very much with Facebook or something like this. Their Facebook has an algorithm, uh, you know, Twitter has an algorithm. Each of these, they've got an algorithm that determines what information you see, even, even Google, right? Determine an uh, algorithm that determines what information you can see. I don't think we necessarily want to, you know, break these companies up or we certainly don't want some sort of external censorship because I don't trust someone in the company or in the government to always be on the right in that. But one of the things that we would profitably do would be give people more choice. So sure, Facebook can run Facebook, but you get to choose what, recommend, what uh, algorithm determines the content in your feed. Maybe you want to use Facebooks. Maybe that's even the default. But you can use, you know, as soon as you open up this, if you make this a requirement, you say, okay, you guys, we're not going to break you up, but you've got to make it possible for people fairly easily to choose an alternative algorithm. Facebook will have this. So immediately, who's going to jump in? Immediately, Google and Amazon and everybody else, you know, all their competitors are going to jump in, and they're going to provide alternative um, uh, algorithms for your feed. And then the open software community is going to jump in, and we'll have actually open algorithms where you can actually see what they do um, that, are, that, that will jump in. And then maybe there'll be private companies that can say, hey, here's my little startup. We've got this good algorithm. It'll give you a better feed than any of these. Uh, $5 a month, you can use ours. But taking these platforms and not necessarily, and maybe we have to do more later, but as a step that's palatable to legislators now, Taking these platforms and saying, "Look, you can you can you can maintain your platform. You're a, you know you are a communication service or whatever, but you cannot force people to accept the information that your algorithms that they don't know what are doing is is choosing for them to for them to see because this is having disastrous consequences on our society at the societal level. It's also exploiting the individual." at the individual level in a way that in the United States we've got a strong legislative precedence against, and I think you've got an even stronger one here. So, that's it. So, yeah, th this is a very interesting point because in the end uh, it's what we are looking for, no? some sort of um, solution or a way out to all this sort of mess. But still, the problem, uh, going back to what Pablo and what Professor Bergson was saying before, this that we are not dealing with something that is as an individual cause. Mm? So we have this sort of threefold issue that is, on the one hand, we have the, the problem of the economic model, no? this uh, ads and keep basic uh, based, uh, uh, profits. On the other hand, there is the market structure that is almost monopolistic. You know? It is not Facebook, it's Twitter, and then there are other few emerging uh, big companies, very uh, powerful uh, actors, and that's all. In terms of the, the huge amount of uh, users and huge amount of uh, the, the, the most of the time we spend, is, is, we don't spend so much time. Wikipedia is so important for us, but during the day, at the end of the day, uh, it's not comparable. No? The, in general, tech, the amount we, we spend, time, the amount of time we spend in, uh, in this kind of platform compared to, to the other one. And finally, there is the government. The government, no? Who decides how the platform works? Who has the power to decide this? No? And, and it's very difficult to approach 
the solution of the problem uh, addressing one single aspect. It, it's complicated because in, in the end, you always end up in a sort of, of a contradiction. So it's it, you know, the kind of, uh, you were explaining before, no? so you cannot ask uh, the one that is making profit to do something mm -hmm. against its own interest. You cannot ask the people to do something. We are looking for something that is entertaining. No? We are tired, we have been working all day, and then you say, no, now you have to choose this content that is so serious. This, this doesn't work. No? Uh, uh, this it's, it's so important, right, is just to turn this a little bit into a conversation, is that People want social media. Yeah. It's like social media is doing these bad things, but people want social media. We can't put that back in the bottle. And we need to find ways to give people social media that doesn't destroy information, right? Yeah. So in the end, we, we have to, to think about the problem from a, a more global uh, perspective. And, and probably there are actions that we can take so let's imagine that we consider information as a sort of public good, and information is public good. Then the platform should be also considered as public goods, in the sense that they are the infrastructure providing us with this kind of uh, necessity, that providing us something that we need. That this information, but then this also entertainment. It's not possi possible to disentangle this both, these two aspects. And so we can try to build alternatives. Okay, maybe this idea, and here is, is a good example that is uh, fulfilling some specific function. Wiki, Wikipedia is something that is fulfilling another specific uh, function. They are not generalist. So in, in the end, this is still unbalanced. But what happened when <laughs> we are trying to negotiate something? Okay, we know that even if it's just a small portion of users that is treating the platform to leave it, the, the, the damage uh, this can cause is relevant for the platform. But the problem is that in order to have community-based action, you need a community. <laughs> and so we go back <laughs> to the starting point, because in order to have a community, you need trust. And trust is under attack all the time. We don't trust each other, we don't trust the authority, we don't trust the journalists. So, there are examples of things that have been done that more or less work, but they are always uh, limited. So in the end, the problem is that we are also maybe focusing a lot on the, the issue of the, of the misinformation again, because this is something that is so easy to conceptualize. We have information, we have misinformation, we have two elements, and you can counterbalance these two things and, th and say, okay, if we remove the misinformation, then we have information and the solution is there, no? it's so easy. But in the end, it, it's just an illusion. No? You, you cannot really uh, solve this complex cultural and societal issue that we are experiencing nowadays, but, but addressing one thing that is just apparently simple, but in the end is so Co in connected and interconnected with anything else that we have to go back and do more, more research with a broader focus and try to understand what's happening in a, in a perspective case that is not so f focused on the, on the solution of an individual problem and go back to a perspective of trying to understand uh, the uh, informational ecosystem. Otherwise, I think that um, we can still experience something that is useful and then it's, in, in, it's in, interesting, but we are always trying to do small steps. We are achieving something while losing something else. We are s still trapped into this, this uh, condition that is not an easy solution for it. Okay. Wow, this is great. I I'm going to take pieces of the last intervention, uh, like this idea of the community governance and research. But since we are in the city first, I think there is a nice story about the city that somehow explains uh, that need. So the first time that the city in Barcelona was deployed, there was a discussion, like in, there was going to be like a participatory process in Barcelona with thousands of proposals. And obviously, the main page was not able to uh, solve all of them. So there was a need to develop some criteria for sorting proposals through a paginated uh, view. So there was some discussion on what was the best algorithm for doing so. 
Uh, there was already some awareness, like other similar platforms, they were sorting by the most popular ones according to the number of votes, so that was creating preferential attachment. So the most popular were going <laughs> even more popular because they were even more visible. So uh, it was pretty clear that it was not the best approach. Another different approach was showing them by residency, so showing the newest ones because maybe they were needed more uh, specific support at the beginning, some momentum, but also they create other kind of biases. So and I, I work on research the, in that, that kind of platform. So petitions that were published in very specific days when many users were coming to the platform, they were able to grow very fast and then yeah. become more uh, visible. So there was a discussion on GitHub in, in the CD on how to address that. It was not solved. And mm -hmm. the final decision was, okay, let's do it random. And random is still the criteria for the CD. So this is one example of how one community one can take decisions and even that they see a challenge or a question, they take decisions on how to try to this is disincentivize non-biases that might affect, in this case, a democratic participatory process. So ideally, for having like an optimal or an acceptable approach, maybe better than random, we need research. And I think this is something that is still challenging, like how we can use these platforms and communities, not only for taking decisions, but also to experiment with these platforms to get evidence yeah. and how to get well-informed decisions as communities. Because if well, we're talking about the CDM, other platforms have been mentioned, but if we think about the big tech, the big tech is the result of massive experimentation. When I say massive experimentation, experiments like some experiment like sewing, like this big experiment done by Facebook, like sewing uh, post that seems more negative to one country group or the other, so that they even affect uh, mental health of, of participants. So obviously this is not the kind of experiments we are looking for, but we need to set up like control scenarios as committees to do experiments that follow some ethical uh, principles, and with those findings, getting well informed decisions, because otherwise we are still, even that we have the governance as a community to take decisions, if we don't have evidence, I think it will be very hard to create artifacts that are effective for creating like safe spaces for online information or safe spaces for political participation of the city. So for sure we need governance and for sure we need research to guide our governance model. So at this point we are accepting uh, uh, questions from the public. So now you are all in the shadow, so you can all... <laughs> Uh, many questions. So. Hello. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, my question was more of an hypothetic because we don't know. <laughs> Most of these things are very new. But we have certain precedents. Uh, some of the precedents, I think so, it's the cookie uh, policy of the GDPR that was placed by the European Union, trying to control which information do we share with the, with the companies and we don't share with the companies. And I think it's been implemented, but it's not a very successful uh, way of implementation and it's very, very, very less complex than to uh, managing an algorithm. So I don't know if you have any opinion on how, for instance, the, the new bill that you mentioned that will take place in the European Union in 2023 will affect this, no? I, I think transparency in the algorithms have, have to happen, but I don't know how or what, and I think no one knows how, <laughs> but I don't know, uh, it's interesting for me to know your opinion because your sort of experts, the three of you, so... <laughs> okay. I, I think this is a very good question. And I, 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 when you're mentioning like the GRD, like, I think it's important to understand like many times like these are general frameworks that they ignore the diverse ecosystem of the internet and the different realities. So you mentioned current regulation, I, I know this from the policy team of the Google Media Foundation, so now there is the Digital Service Act that will affect uh, content regulation. And even that this is bringing uh, some very positive values in terms of transparency and in terms of accountability uh, of how information appears in these platforms. This, the current draft is mostly focused on platforms that are fully mediated by algorithms. So for platforms like 
Wikipedia, or even platforms that are uh, that are community driven and or platforms that are uh, curated by volunteers like Reddit or obviously the CD, these can be very risky because they are going to apply some principles of uh, automat automatization in terms of uh, strict deadlines to remove uh, this information or like uh, top-down directives on how to handle uh, this information that maybe will enter into conflict with this community driven approach. So I, I, I agree, I think it's, it's quite complex how to create digital frameworks in systems that are so diverse. And obviously it's important to differentiate like different kind of platforms and what we are bringing about economic models around community driven uh, decision making or, or algorithm driven uh, decision making, I think it's something that should be taken into account. There and then there. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. I mean, the um, I've always been surprised that there were that uh, a customizable algorithm had never been actually proposed. This is something that has always surprised me because the need is here. I mean, I'm not a really social network person, but I've been on these tech platforms and. It's a, a feeling of lack of control, which is crazy. I mean, I don't want to see that, and you don't have any control on that. But before being transparent, my question is, is uh, solutions like Mastodon and these decentralized uh, social networks part of the answer, or would it lead to a, a totally fragmented uh, uh, network? So is, is, it, yeah, is it a viable solution before having control on the algorithm or not? I don't know enough. Can you be able to answer that in enough? Is, in more, either are you able to answer that in more detail? I, I don't. I don't know. I intend to say something. I'm not an expert about Mastodon, but in general, the problem is that once you have Twitter, it's very difficult to trigger uh, large-scale migration to a similar platform. So it's again a matter of preferential attachments. The people, new people, new users entering the platform where most of the people is. It's, it's something that is almost natural. Then, uh, okay, you can still do something in the sense that uh, you can create new community, maybe more specific, specific or thematic and of people that use both, but mostly the other one. And little by little, we don't know because in the end, it's still possible that a platform that is just uh, used by a minority, in the end, people get, get really, really tired and sick of the policy of, of Twitter, for instance, that is the, the, the similar one, and then you have this sort of massive uh, change. And if the change happens, if the change happens, then the difference is, again, I'm pretty sure the difference is, is clear and is a good one because we have the, the, the open, the, co the, the, all the argument, the cause is it's, it's not private and, and you have this kind of decentralized structure. So there are many advantages of this, this other kind of, uh, of, of platforms. Still, it's, it's just, this is a split question. It's uh, are things that may happen or may not. We don't know when. I can, like this, this is something that has been already discussed, but uh, I, I read this tweet uh, yesterday by Michael Bernstein, who is a professor at the Stanford University, and he was trying to approach this issue. So he was saying like, I agree with the challenges facing centralized online platforms, but jumping to the centralized as, as a solution strikes me as a misdirection. Like the core question is governance. Like instead of centralized, to the centralized, Maybe we need to think about governance. I think this is this is very clever, and that relates to how we were being discussed this morning. Like for sure, decentralization can bring some benefits, and we can think about many examples in which decentralization uh, brings uh, some benefits to to our communities. I think, particularly with truly decentralized power, this is in the core of democracy. But in the core of democracy, is the governance uh, governance model. So we need to decentralize, but we need also to think. Uh, in the governance of that decentralization process. One other question there. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, so I'm thinking um, regarding the platform, you speak about um, the disinformation networks as some kind of uh, ethological weapons, and as a part of that network, as an individual, um, 
I'm, I'm a victim of that, but I'm also a, I'm some kind of weapon. And how could I, as an individual, stop being a, a weapon? Uh, what could I, could I do? Um, without the, the ability maybe to, to know if this is disinformation or actual information. So I think that uh, one of the, I mean, so, right, so this is a very interesting thing that, that happens with social networks, right? I mean, so there's, there's kind of two phenomena as we think about misinformation and disinformation on social networks. One is sort of the organic creation and spread of misinformation by accident. The other is the vulnerability of social networks to deliberate injection of disinformation into that network. And particularly for the latter, like you say, you become a, you're a victim of it and you also become weaponized. Because when I spread uh, deliberately injected disinformation, I am leveraging my own social capital to spread, accidentally spread somebody else's disinformative message. So what do we do about that? I mean, one, of course, train people. We have you know, a very simple saying when we talk about high school, our little program we do for high schoolers, uh, think more, share less, All right? So, uh, so you know, each of us can do a little bit of a little bit more thinking and a little bit less sharing and we're a little bit less weaponizable. But I don't think ultimately this is a complete solution. I really think that we have to think, we have to ask the question, uh, uh, these deeper questions about how social networks operate and what is it about social networks that, uh, that, that, that make them so problematic. There's research, for example, by the um, economist Matt Jackson that has just come out, a very nice paper, uh, not because it gives any final answers, but it's a theoretical model, sort of proof of approach, where they look at how the, uh, the, uh, the breadth of a social network, so that is how many people can I share a message to, and the depth of a social network, how many times can a message be reshared? How do those two things affect the propensity of disinformation to spread on that network? By restricting those things, particularly the depth, uh, one can control disinformation much more. So it may be something, see, I'm very, I, my general perspective after you know, uh, thinking about this for, for several years is very much that we don't want to try to impose you know, censorship on things. We don't want to tell people what they have to read. We, don't want to, we, don't, we can't, social media genies out of the bottle. We can't put it back in. People want it, like you say, it's entertainment, it's tied in with our information. But what we can do is we can think about the structures of these networks and, what, and, and we can think about how some structures may be healthier than others. And some structures may allow us to act productively and positively in the ways we want to. Other structures may be likely to turn us into unwilling pawns of things, whether it's selling ads for Facebook or spreading misinformation for Russia. And uh, so I think by I think that for me is one of the really fascinating questions, and one of the really urgent, vital questions to think quickly about is how the structures of communication networks affect the kinds of information that moves on them. Thank you. One last question. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to ask about the, the question of the scale, because we are talking all the time about mm -hmm. the social networks and they are uh, so big and they, are, uh, they operate at the global level and they have a very a high level of centralization of everything, infrastructure, information, data, etc. And definitely from the CDM we are, our hypothesis on this sense is how we can being in the other scales, more distributed scales, but how we can assume that in a small uh, scales we can create our own rules to decide what is and what is not uh, misinformation and what is and what is not a, a real content, and how we can create communities that they can uh, they can govern for ourselves uh, this environment. We have the experience in Barcelona. It's a city we have. Uh, one uh, one hundred thousand people registered in the platform, and no trolling, no right. trolling, because we have like a, a robust and we have a kind of uh, 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 
deliberation process and creation of, of proposals based on the, the interest of the citizens, not on uh, to maximize attention to spread some some bullshit. Right. And I think that, that the question of the scale is is so important to to uh, to see in the in which solution we can apply. Because if we just see that the big social networks and this centralized model, definitely I, I think that we have to close them <laughs> because they are uh, wasting a lot of energy. They are uh, privatiz privatizing all the public digital uh, okay. space. And, and we need to invent something uh, different, public and with, with citizens and with all the other governing rules. Well, I think you're completely right about scale. This is something I'm really my thoughts been changing about a lot. Uh, I was talking again with, with my friend Brandon Bonu, he's a, a professor at Yale and a very a complex systems researcher and very, very thoughtful about this. And he was, he's been studying recently uh, some of the successful uh, uh, web-based uh, uh, discussion board communities from the late 1990s and looking at how this, and, and basically again, little or no trolling and extremism on these communities. And one hypothesis that he's been proposing is that it does have to do with scale. They're, they're smaller scale communities. They're much better able to self-police. There's uh, another way that he says is, you know, people that are, people with extreme views and opinions are not able to find each other and form large enough coalitions to wreak large scale havoc across all areas. So because the uh, you know, he's studying, for example, uh, you know, sports fans, uh, hip hop, uh, music forums, things like this. And if a group starts to create trouble on the hip hop music forum, they can't then export that trouble to all the other forums because they're separate, right? And and so there is this scale issue that's so fundamental. I haven't really appreciated this adequately a month ago, so I don't want to say much more except for that I really sympathize with what you're saying, and I have a lot of hope for smaller decentralized platforms. I guess the final thing I'd say about this is we talk about social media, social media, social media. There's nothing social about me being able to get up in the morning and write something stupid that three million people have read. That is not a social thing. That is broadcast technology. Straight and forward broadcast technology. Social media is me talking with 100 to 200 people, max. And so I think we need to think about what is it that we want? What is it that people want when they're looking for social interaction? And what is it that people want when they want broadcast technology? And maybe there are ways to decouple these that will be useful and powerful uh, so that people don't play the social power games on broadcast technologies uh, that we now suffer from. So, uh, yeah, okay, maybe I add something because <laughs> Really, I am under the pressure that when people, when you say this kind of thing, is something like, okay, this planet is too polluted, let's leave it. Okay, so it's very nice that the CDM exists, that Wikimedia uh, and Foundation is uh, operating, and there is the Wikipedia and all this kind of stuff. But still, uh, there are masses and masses of people that are looking for entertainment. They are not. Uh, in a small community, they are maybe nerd of something and they need to go to strangers on the other side of the planet. Uh, people that they don't even know in the beginning that they, were, they are interested in their thing. So they, they, the function that the generalist uh, platform is playing, the, the, the kind of service that this platform is providing, it's not that something that can be so easily replaced by other kind of environment that are necessary, necessary and beautiful and extremely. Um, it, it's important to preserve and to improve those kind of environment, but they are not the same thing. It's, it's something that is completely different. If you are very tired after a day of work and, and you need to disconnect and to go to TikTok, you are not entering the city deliberately about something in the evening. So, so still, you cannot uh, say, okay, let's leave them, because the people is there. Yeah. <laughs> like, so finally, like, in terms of this kind of questions of the scale, I'm going to repeat this, but we honestly need more research to, really, to answer these kind of questions, 
So thanks to our colleagues Bruno Aguilo and uh, Frank Keller, we're going to open the CDM and the space for research. So if you are a researcher interested in how to uh, do research to improve democracy through the CDM, please join us, join the team, join the community, and try to build together a better platform. So uh, we end it here. Thank you for your ideas. Thank you for listening and for your contributions. Thank you.